The shard horses went. Modern tractors. You know, pure water, it's lovely, beautiful water. And uh, I used to ride on the combine. Living off the land, 100 years of farming in South Devon. Episode 4, Working Machinery. How we power the farm. Horses. That's not the hoofs of a shire horse, that's a hoofs of a racehorse. It's our daughter has got a hobby and uh, we've got one or two horses that we've bred. We've been lucky enough uh, to have Sarah to exercise them. And it's uh, something we can just about to manage to have as a leisure pastime because we can feed them from the farm. The shire horses went in the mid 50s. But they didn't do a lot of work but i did see them working and my grandfather actually took me into the field across the way and by the way fields have got names and that field was called Gratton. and uh, that field my, i remember going with my granddad with the shire horse and the wagon to pick up the sheaves of corn and it was probably in the late late 40s when i was probably four or five years old sitting on the front of the wagon with him and it wasn't until probably when I was 50 ish I was talking to my dad about it and he said do you know he said your grandfather put that shire horse in that wagon to take you to the field to get the sheaves of corn to just show you what they used to do and it was the only reason he took the, the wagon there that day was to take you because my husband, who, as I say, would be almost 70, actually, um, they were still using horses when he was young to farm. But fairly, I mean, most, most people had tractors by then, but uh, they, they well, still... Dad, had dad was the what, last one to plough, wasn't he, in Hobbiton? I think so, yeah. Um, yeah. Just so he could do it. Yeah. The horsepower finished in the 1950s. Um, in that respect, Mr Wills, the man who's picking up potatoes with these yellow pudlocks on or his yellow <laughs> plastic pegs around his leg. He used to drill the corn. It was to give make economic sense of what he was doing. Oh yeah, the horses, yeah, we just kept them for a while and then off they went. Um, my early memories of, of this farm are of horses. But we used to run a tractor and a horse and some of the jobs were done by a tractor and some of the jobs were done by horse. When I was home weekends from school, I used to get all the horse jobs because we still had a couple of horses in those days. They used to have the horse and wagon and the, the horse and cart. And obviously those were quite important things in those days. And uh, my job used to be to go out and pick up all the hedge trimmings, hedge pairings as we call them, because they were obviously cut off by hand and left down the side of the foot of the hedge, either in the roadside or in the fields. We, and I used to have a, a, a mate that used to come and help me on a Friday night and Saturday pick up those hedge trimmings because they were then put back to one side and kept to cover up the winter crops like the mangoes that we used to grow. Because we used to grow mangoes, sugar beet mangoes and swedes. And the mangoes, well, and the sugar beet used to be hoed out by hand. There used to be six of us out hoeing. And st some would start at like 8 o'clock in the morning and, and I'd start a bit later and my father when he arrived was a bit later still, you know. <laughs> used to be, we used to have a few laughs but it was a qu quite a very laborious job because we'd start hoeing like at the end of April and we'd be probably finish hoeing at the end of June, middle of first week in July. But those, those crops had to be singled, as we called them, by hand. You know, there was no such thing as precision drilling when, when we first started. And then we got these crops that were precision made, which cut out a lot of the singling. I think I can remember two shire horses here, but we used to grow a lot of potatoes and cauliflower. 
and we used to use the horse mainly with a wagon that you could walk down through the field of cauliflowers and it wouldn't make so much mess as a tractor would and you could tell a horse to walk on and stop without actually having to get on and off it so you'd be cutting cauliflower not that I was old enough to do that and that's how they and then used to bring them back in the wagon and that's the last thing that a horse was used for here yeah I could tell you a few stories about horses my father passed on to me I mean I remember him telling me about one horse they theirs went lame one of theirs went lame they borrowed one from a next door neighbor to do something and the horse previously had worked for the county so <laughs> And he said, if you were going past that shed, anything after sort of half past four in the afternoon, the horse was only interested in one thing, and they'd do it. They'd do it on their own. So line themselves up, back straight in the shed. You wouldn't have to direct them. They could put a cart in. The, and he said, because the roof was low, you had to bail out off the cart very quickly. But they evidently were very, very intelligent animals. I, I mean, you could, you could tell them what to do. You didn't have to get on them or anything like that. And they could evidently think for themselves. They understood what you were doing. I'm sure they did that. Um, they must have done because, as I understand, you could get them to, you know, they used to have commands. I suppose you do now to a certain extent, mm -hmm. but even more, you weren't actually on the animal. Some used to be led a bit, but if you were out in the field and you were, like if you were picking those up, the horse would walk down through with a wagon and start and go, start, stop and start as and when you wanted it to. And you wouldn't have to do very much more than that. You wouldn't have to have reins or anything like that until you actually took it, took the load home. Different, wasn't it? I mean, you don't. Well, you do. You swear at your tractor occasionally, but you don't. You don't. You haven't got that relationship. <laughs> Mechanisation. The first combine harvester I ever saw was, I think it was called an MM, which is an American one, and it was towed by a tractor, and it was in a field near Modbury, and it was something special to see this machine that could actually thrash the corn as just after it has cut it, and uh, of course we went on to have our own own little little combine which we used to tow behind the tractor, and. Uh, and initially everything was done in sacks of corn it was always sacks of corn and they, the uh, the first ones I remember were 200 weight which is 100 kilograms and then they became uh, one and a half hundred weights and I used to ride on the combine and there was no cab and it was full of dust and you were happy to be going against the breeze so that the breeze would what, what, get the dust away just while you were going across the field one way and then coming back the other way you were full of dust again and don't know whether to breathe or not. And my job was to fill the sacks and put them in the chute and on the combine and uh, whereas my uh, father or even Fred, the man on the farm, would be driving the tractor pulling it. And if we had a good day, we did uh, 20 acres with 200 sacks, which would be a tonne and a half an acre. Um, and then of course it moved on to bulk handling and when it got to bulk handling is really when we decided to have the contractor in because it meant that we could run around with the bulk grain and the uh, the hired in contractor was uh, able to uh, just be cutting it for us. Even when I was young it was all all the harvesting was done into small bales with the hay and the straw you would have or, you know, any amount of people would come and help with you know your friends from school or whatever from the village, and um, we quite often have like a dozen or so people. And I can remember riding around on top of the trailers around the village and knocking on people's windows as you went past <laughs> and all those sort of things. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's that has um, that's almost gone now. Really, um, people don't. I mean, we we've moved now all to big bales and. Um, even when we occasionally do some small bales, it's very difficult to find people who are willing to come and help anymore um, to do the work. So um, that is, that's, that's kind of how memories have changed, I think, as well. <laughs> do you remember the last time you managed to get that very old small combine up the top, past the village hall? And, and I realised that there was going to be a problem getting it through the village. And I got up reasonably early and I was 
went through the village and there were one or two cars that were obviously going to make it too narrow. And one lot were holiday makers with a huge car outside this cottage. <laughs> and I knocked on the door, I said, I'm terribly sorry, I know you came down yesterday and you're tired and I'm sorry to get you out, but we're trying to get a combine down here in about half an hour and could you possibly move this car? And they were absolutely delightful. And do you know what they said? Oh, is this a tradition? Does it happen every Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're harvesting. Fortunately not. <laughs> uh, you haven't grown any corn since then, have you? Not in the village, no. That no. combine fell to no. bits, I think, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They used to tip the apples in on that with that piece of concrete block is now into 
That's a, an old corn crusher, which is no longer used. Could be used, but nobody wants to use these ancient machines. <laughs> this, act, this act is what we call a winnowing machine. Right? When we used to, after we'd harvest the grain, and we'd prepare the, the grain, what we wanted to keep for seed for the next year, we'd put it through this winnowing machine. It separated all the rubbish out from the good grains, took out all the rubbish and all the small grains, and you were left with good grains in the front, which obviously was all done by hand. We used to take it in terms of turning this window machine. We'd be doing it for days on end to get the necessary amount of grain for sowing next year. The machine at the back is what we call a grading, corn grading machine. We used to show quite a bit of but went barley, wheat and oats in years gone by and we used to put it through that grading machine that really used to take out the small grains and you left with a lovely plump sample. We were quite successful with showing our cereals. One of my earliest memories, I was about four I think, uh, I go to shows now and I always stop and look at steam engines and thrashing machines and things like that and one of my earliest memories was mother took my brother William and I up to the outside of the village, Higher Farm Corner, waiting for the thrashing machine to come, and the thrashing machine came behind a steam engine. And it was Mr. Goodman, and it's something which I've never, ever forgotten. The thrashing machine coming down into the dip by Moorwell Pond at the entrance of the village, and then chuff, 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 coming up towards us up at Higher Farm Corner. And he pulled into Grantford's Torrens plot, uh, where all his ricks was, and that has always stuck in my mind. farm and the farmhouse. We have our own uh, spring water which is lovely to drink. Um, it's rising from a spring but the, the, the particular spring water I'm talking about um, is piped from a reservoir where the spring is in the side of the hill and uh, that reservoir probably holds at least 2,000 gallons and uh, those iron pipes are underground and, and they've been feeding the farm I would imagine 150 years at least. We've got main supply, which actually, which actually um, supplies the the renovated old cider press building. It also supplies um, two barn conversions that we've done, uh, and that mains comes from just just across one of the fields over to the road, and. Uh, that, that but our own spring supply wouldn't be enough water in a dry time to supply all the uh, all the uh, premises. Our neighbours used to come to use the telephone because, you see, not very many people had telephones, but we happened to have the telephone there. And uh, your neighbours would come and want to use the phone. Well, I mean, they'd come perhaps at the most inconvenient time and it usually had the phone in the lounge those days. It wasn't always convenient to take messages or... Life is so different. I used to get the mail delivered with a pony. You know, a gentleman or a postman on a pony. And he used to come in one way and go up through the fields and come out here on Road Street. It's lovely, isn't it? And then sometimes you'd get people asking you to give your neighbours messages. You see, things like that you take for granted today, don't you? I remember when, when I was also young, very young, the, the clothes were washed in a, in a copper and uh, a copper is heated by uh, solid fuel and uh, of course it just, uh, 
it's quite a great big bowl of water which uh, my grandmother well and my mum for that matter uh, used and there were two coppers one in the one in the farmhouse and one in the little outbuilding just below the farmhouse down by the cellar and I remember um, my mum uh, actually using them we had this chute you see down home we had a continuous running in the back well further down the back kitchen we had a continuous running stream from the farm you know pure water it was lovely beautiful water and uh, you could put anything there to keep it cold you'd stand it in something to keep it cold and you know if i wanted to cool a custard quickly i would uh, stand it in something it would be lovely you'd shop weekly and really not buy more than you wanted that you could keep for the week meat we had delivered um, you know, we'd have a butcher, a travelling butcher come in the week. You'd buy a joint for the weekend when you went did your shopping. And then you'd get a butcher in the middle of the week, which would be a help. And we had a butter well just outside of the farm as well because before fridges and before washing machines, this is how they did it. A butter well, well it wasn't uh, a very posh water, a butter well, but a butter well really was somewhere with made of flagstones beside the stream just to be as cool as possible for obviously the butter or the cream just to help keep it cool in the summertime as if it's near a stream as you would know if you go in a stream if you've got hot feet with wellington boots on you can cool your feet down this oh. butter well wouldn't be a well as we know wells it's not not a deep source of water where you gather water it was just a butter well which was beside the stream to keep things cool you used to have gangs of men picking up the sheaves. But again, you see, that's all changed. You've seen these gigantic round and square bales in the field, which are all handled by machine. Stacked on the trailer by machine, stacked in the shed by machine. And that's the big change. It's all machines. Whereas farming was quite a, and still is, I suppose, physical job. Um, and didn't perhaps, it had, it had different skills, but the skills you have to have now with, um, I mean, one of the tractors we got out there, the first thing you do is switch on the computer. Well, I mean, that is, you bear, you think in, in terms of, first, what I call modern tractors, because there was the older ones again than that. Um, it's just a totally different world. Totally different world. Not necessarily better either, but um, it is in respect or isn't. I don't think that my generation have got the aches and pains that my father's generation had. They wore themselves out, really. Um, well, I think they did anyway. It's not the dirt. It's not such a dirty job as it was. Um, I mean, when they used to th use the thrashing machine for doing the sheaves, I mean, the dust and the mess with that was terrible. Um, I mean, most. Combine harvesters now again have got an air-conditioned cab on and you can be in there in your shirt sleeves and not get dirty all day, whereas you used to. Um, so it's healthier in that respect. This was this is where I used to put the cows by hand. In here, 11 cows. Milking them by hand. There'd be 11 stalls in there, you see. Well, of course, today they're all parlours, aren't they? And they're even milking cows both robots now, did you know that? Did you know? Milking them with robots. There was always a company called West of England Sack Company. You used to be able to hire the sacks and you used to do that and they were made out of um, jute. And they would hold, um, as I know it, 200 weight, which is 100 kilos. Which when you now think that the EU doesn't want us to lift any more than 20 kilos and they were five times the size and we used to what used to have two of you to put them to get them up on a height like, like that with a trailer or something like that but after that you used to carry them on your back and walk with them the old joke was oh yes you used to take them back and, and then put them on my back and carry them up the granary steps which is always up to the next level well, they must, that must have been really, really back-breaking. I did, we had a short period where we used them, but we mechanised it as much as we could um, by using, lifting a friend and loader on the tractor to lift them in the field, lift them onto the trailer, 
and then have an elevator back in the in the barn to move them but um uh yeah and also all the hay bales straw bales the little ones used to that was not so much heavy but pure quantity hundreds and well thousands and thousands on bigger farms whereas now you have a great big shed and you go in there with a great big machine and you just stack them all away and um quite different different skills this was this is where I used to put the cows by hand in here 11 cows milking them by hand there'd be 11 stalls in there you see because the day they're all parlors aren't they and they're even milking cows both robots now did you know that did you know milking them with robots Working Machinery, we heard from Harry Kurzweil, Jill Kurzweil, David Dark, Phil Dark, David Wall, Mark Wall, Richard Foss, John Sherrill, Jean Sherrill, Roger Tucker, John Tucker, Bill Salter and Marjorie Buckpitt. Living Off the Land was produced by Lucinda Guy for Sound Art Radio in partnership with South Devon Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty and was supported by the Heritage Lottery Fund as part of All Our Stories. Mm -hmm.